10 weeks of an emotional roller coaster and we finally reached the finale of Lovecraft Country which is bittersweet. It has been an incredible series but if I'm honest I have mixed feelings about this episode. There were a few questionable things like why didn't Letty kill Christina and leave no loose endings and should we be happy that Dee's now a murderer? I think over the season we've had some amazing character arcs and there were a few missed opportunities like for example Ruby but I'll speak about her later. Nonetheless, I am opinionated Olivia and I'm here to break down the season finale full circle and pick out a few Easter eggs you may have missed. Hello to all my subscribers, I hope you are well and safe. And hello if you're new, welcome. Hit that subscription button if you like what I have to say. Now let's get into this. This week's episode picks up with our heroes returning from the observatory back in Chicago. They have the book of names in hand and they are determined to save Dee and stop Christina's evil plan. They all surround Dee's bed as she's almost turned into a topsy-bopsy character. Tick reads the spell that Hetty gave to Letty in Tulsa. As he does, the Book of Names opens and stops on a page which has a symbol of his birthmark on it. This causes Tick and Letty to fall unconscious and they wake up in an ancestral plane, similar to the one shown in Black Panther. We are already familiar with this dimension as it's been shown quite a lot throughout the series through Letty and Tick's dreams. So Atticus finally gets to meet and speak to Hannah while Letty meets Hattie from last week. We learn that Hannah created a spell to protect the family. This caused the birthmark that Atticus and his family have as well as creating this fiery dimension. Hannah explains how she originally thought that this was hell however she's learned how to control the magic and it is essentially paradise. We learn that once Atticus's family members pass over they will all end up here. Hannah tells Tick that magic should not be feared but passed on. To me I interpreted this as knowledge being passed on from generation to generation. There is a tender moment as Tick rests his head on his mother's lap. I saw this as a Jesus parallel but I will go into that more detail later on. Dora tells him that he's the best of both George and Montrose and we still do not learn who his father is but I'm kind of leaning more towards George now because if it was Montrose she would just be like yeah he's your father. Atticus and Letty discover that Tick must sacrifice himself in order to serve a greater purpose. He will be helping a generation of black people who will follow him. The older generations have paved the way to make the world the way it is today. We ain't walking toward an altar to sacrifice ourselves for something important. What is our purpose? And although Tick doesn't want to believe it at first, he does change. His fear eventually leaves him and he becomes kinder. And we see this later on in the episode, especially when he's with Gia. And we see a whole transformation with his character arc. They all gather around Dee to heal her. But unfortunately, her arm cannot be saved. And yes, as we guessed it, she's the woman with the robotic arm from the future. I was there for a second before the woman in the hood came in, shoved the book in my hand, pushed me back to the port. With the robotic arm. In a later flashback, we see Hippolyta and it looks like she's just performed surgery. I'm assuming this is when she gave Dee her robotic arm. Also, when Tick went to the future, he saw white people rioting. And as we know, they complete a spell to remove the magic from white people. So this could possibly be the repercussions. The group discuss the plan and Atticus says that they're going to use Christina's spell against her. So he will need himself, Christina and Titus. Which might be tricky considering Titus is dead and Christina's not going to give up herself willingly. But as you know, our group do not give up that easily. They cast a spell to bring back Titus, but he manages to teleport to Christina and warn her that they have the Book of Names. He appears in the middle of the road and it causes Christina to crash. But of course she's fine because she's got the invulnerability spell. However, I noticed she didn't give this to Ruby. Again, this shows the dynamics between their relationship. Why wouldn't she protect Ruby if she claims that she loves her? Really, I don't think so. Anyway, Tick, Letty, Hannah, Dory and Hattie manage to bring him back into the circle. And in a gruesome scene, Tick cuts out a bit of Titus's skin, which they'll need later. This was a very similar scene to what we saw Sam doing in episode Whitey's on the Moon. And we're starting to see how everything is becoming full circle. See what I did there? Cut to Dee, who's understandably upset with Hippolyta, who abandoned her while she's on her fantastical multiverse travels. Dee's yet to understand that while Hippolyta was on her travels, she was gaining more knowledge that she will pass down to her daughter. But obviously Hippolyta does feel guilty, and I think this is when she decides that she's going to make the robotic arm for Dee, which she does off-scene, and it kind of annoys me that some of the scenes they decided to do off-scene... Christina is fuming that Letty and Tick have the book of names so she attempts to cut one last deal. She says that she'll spare Atticus's life because she believes the book of names might have a spell which won't require a sacrifice. But we all know if there is not a spell in that book that won't require Atticus to be sacrificed Christina will be right there trying to kill him so they definitely made a good call on that. She makes a point to say it's not personal and in my eyes I believe that she thinks this is merely a necessary sacrifice for her to achieve immortality. Once again telling us that Christina only cares about her own agenda. 
Though she may have feelings for Ruby, her desires to have the power of a white man conquers all of this. She sort of has an understanding for the black second class citizens. However, her agenda outweighs this. Christina's character arc is a criticism of white feminists who are often coming from a place of privilege. Their agendas are not inclusive to all women, including women of colour. And this is further proven when we see how she treats Ruby later. Christina is pissed and she removes the mark of Cain that she had earlier given to Letty, the spite. But we see later how Letty gets this back, but I'll come back to that. Gia is across town being chatted up by a white man who assumes he's from Japan. This scene just really points out how ignorant people can be. I mean, there is more countries in Southeast Asia apart from Japan and China. And I loved seeing him scurry off when she asks him if he's willing to die to fuck her. Love that. Tick shows up because he has earlier called her and the two have a heart to heart. He apologises for saying that their love was never real and he explains that he didn't acknowledge it because that meant acknowledging he would die. And as you can see, Tick's behaviour was all coming out of a place of fear. Dia tells him that her mother has recently died and she's worried that her ability to feel dies with her. But he helps her telling her that she has feelings, she's merely just grieving. He also tells her that they have a choice, whether they want to be monsters or heroes. But this kind of contradicts what his mother told him earlier. She said it's all down to fate. It's an interesting question because do we really have a choice or is everything in our life down to fate? Note how Gia is wearing red and in the next scene Letty's wearing blue. Tick, what are you going to pick? The red pill or the blue pill? No, I'm joking. But red represents danger, courage, strength and power. All things Gia is. Remember when we were introduced to her as a red-skinned alien? Whereas blue symbolises loyalty, integrity and responsibility. All things Letty has grown to be. Speaking of Letty... We see her and Ruby at the cemetery. Letty confesses she was unable to attend their mother's funeral because she was in jail. Letty pleads with Ruby to get a piece of Christina, speaking on the fact that they are family. But Ruby feels like Letty only uses her and is in fact trying to emotionally blackmail her. So initially she refuses. We then see Dee who's crossing out the faces of the white jurors who acquitted Edmund Till's killers. As we know, this was real life. One of the murderers, Roy Bryant, was a husband of the white woman who made accusations against Till. The other one was J.W. Malam, who was Roy's half-brother, and they were both found not guilty by a white jury. Even though they later admitted to the crime, due to the double jeopardy, they could not be retrialed. And Caroline Bryant later retracted her original statement, to which she accused Till of harassment. I think including this scene explains Dee's motives for killing Christina. Remember, even though Dee is a child, she has lived through one of her friends being murdered with no justice and she was cursed by Captain L and tortured. And like I explained from my review for episode 8, Dee has seen firsthand how the white world treats black boys and girls. As a result, she's become hardened and I think she's got a rage fueling inside her. I think this explains why she says the following. You still haven't learned. When Hippolyta draws a comic for Dee to make amends, she tells Dee that Athua taught her how to draw. This is a shout out to Athua Richardson, who is an African Native American artist. She drew all of Dee's artwork for the show, which is pretty cool, hey? As we know, Letty's found God after being resurrected, so she encourages Tick to be baptised. Just saying, another biblical reference there. Ruby meets Christina and it's clear that she's conflicted as to whether she should help Letty or not. They share a romantic moment and kiss for the first time as themselves. It is left unanswered as to whether Ruby decides to help Letty at this moment. The gang pack up to head to Arden in order to complete the binding spell. As they do, Ruby arrives, well, Christina and Ruby's body, and she hands over what is supposedly Christina's blood to Letty. So what wasn't shown on screen is Ruby decides to help her sister after all, but Christina catches her and puts her into a coma. I'm not sure she's dead though. Drawing on the fact they were never equals, and it shows that Christina's willing to sacrifice anything for her power. It was comforting to know that in the end, Ruby decided to help her family and help the greater good. And I think it's really a shame that they decided to have this scene off screen because Ruby's character development has been really interesting. She's been built up to only care about her equality to Christina and not really caring about the rest of her family. However, in the last minute, she decides to go with the greater good and I think it's a shame that she didn't get that recognition. I think they kind of did her dirty with that. As the group make their way to Arden, we see a nice moment in the car. But this is the first hint that Ruby wasn't really herself. In episode one, Ruby says she dislikes the song. Life could be a dream, she booms your board. But now she's the one needing everyone singing Life Could Be A Dream. When they reach Arden, they prepare the spell. Tick pinches his nose and swallows a piece of Titus. Hmm, chicken. And he also swallows what is supposedly Christina's blood. And all seems to be going fine until Letty notices Ruby's behaving a bit oddly. This is when we learn Christina is in fact Ruby. She reveals she caught Ruby trying to help Letty and she had to kill her. 
but Ruby made Christina promise that she would not harm Letty. The two have a little fight and Christina pushes Letty out of the window and it looks like she dies. And this is why Christina restores the mark of Cain to Letty. Through Gia's flashbacks, we see that Christina does in fact do the spell to put it back. And this is also when we see Tick teaching Dee how to train a shrug off, explaining why it follows her later. One thing I will say about Christina, she's definitely a woman of a word and she probably did have feelings for Ruby because she did keep her word. Hippolyta, Montrose and Gia are attacked by the villagers. While this is happening, Dee is left alone in a car. I don't know why these guys keep leaving her alone, especially in the woods where it's full of shoggoths. Anyway, a white shoggoth comes to attack her, but she's protected by the black one. We then cut to Christina, who's about to start her immortality ritual on Tick. She slits his arms and she's drenched in his blood and she decides to drink it. It was so gross. But to me, this bloodshed represents the bloodshed of many black people throughout history. Their blood was shed in order to help white people stay in power and achieve their accomplishments. Letty wakes up, but she's too late. She tries to save Tick and she mouths, I love you, before he dies. She stabs Christina and tries to cast a spell, which Christina finds funny and tells her that she's too late. She's now immortal. Hippolyta points out that the spell won't work unless Christina and Tick's bodies are connected. At this point, Gia remembers what the shaman said to her. She has not yet become one with darkness, so she uses her tentacles to connect the two. Through this, we see a series of flashbacks, which include Ruby's body in Christina's lab, Letty baptising Tick, detraining the Shoggoth, and Tick handing Hippolyta a letter. Right, so I'm not sure if Gia was able to transfer Christina's immortality to Tick, but I guess we have to wait to season two to find out. Christina realised that her immortality is gone when she tries to do a spell. And Letty walks over the Book of Names and tells her that it will not work because she no longer has magic. And she tells Christina that every white person will no longer have magic. We see Tick's lifeless body, which resembles Jesus on the cross. Throughout the whole ritual, there was definitely crucifixion symbolism. So one interpretation is that, like Jesus, Tick has sacrificed himself for the greater good but i also believe that maybe tick will be resurrected too maybe it's wishful thinking but i just think there's way too much um crucifixion symbolism and in a heartbreaking scene montrose tries to wake up tick while letty sobs montrose really refuses to believe that his son is dead i mean this is something that he was trying to prevent from happening it's only when hippolyta hands him the letter from tick he finally accepts that he's gone and this letter is pretty much the thesis for the series there's neither happiness nor misery in the world only the comparison of the two throughout this series we've seen how everything is measured by opposites black and white good and evil life and death letty is pregnant with a child that will benefit from tick's sacrifice and Montrose can redeem himself from being an abusive father. And in the final, final scene for season one, we see how Christina is stuck under some rubble as Dee approaches. Christina begs Dee to help her, but Dee's looking at her like, what, me? Help you? Bitch, please. And Dee goes on to say they still haven't learnt. How can a white woman expect a black girl to help her after she just killed her brother or cousin? Christina literally doesn't have a clue, but this is her arrogance showing. But anyway... We see Dee and her new robotic arm crushes Christina's neck and her shoggoth roars into the moonlight. The end. So, if I am completely honest, I was quite disappointed in the finale. But to be fair, after last week's epic episode, I don't really know how they could follow on for it. But overall, the series was amazing. In my opinion, I absolutely loved it. I think now's definitely a few highlight episodes. Love how it combines social commentary sci-fi horror it tackled racism identity sexuality empowerment feminism and i really learned so much from this series so if there is a season two i can definitely see d being center stage i think it's going to explore a world where the black people are the dominant race and like tick said he went to the future and he saw white people rioting so i think it's going to explore the repercussions of this but ruby cannot be dead seriously because they did her so dirty she needs to come back because that was not okay and i definitely think tick is going to be back in some shape way or form but i'd be really interested to know what you guys thought of the season finale did you enjoy it did you not really like it were you kind of like me like mm, i was expecting it to be slightly better and what are your predictions for next season also if you have any series that you are currently watching that you think i should be discussing let me know and on that note, bye for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give a thumbs up. Peace out. Bye.